Pastor Andrew Campbell, I'm the worship pastor here at GFN Church. We are so glad that you have come to worship with us this morning. Would you stand with us as we remind ourselves why it is we've come into this place this morning? Sing in the name.
Man, good morning, uh, GFN Church. Man, I love the line in that song that there is hope in his name. Man, I love the fact that, man, it doesn't matter what we're dealing with and what's going on. And I know a lot of us have shown up this morning just weary from the different things of life. But just know this morning that there is hope in his name. And so we gather together to worship him, to lift him up. Some of us, we have gathered together to cry out to him this morning. But man, just be reminded that there is hope this morning because our God saves. In him, we've got victory this morning. So once again, I just want to welcome you here to GFN Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us. Uh, For those that are in person and those that are joining us online, uh, thank you so much. We know that God has got great things in store for each and every one of us. I want you to know, if you're a first-time guest with us, we want to encourage you. We want you to know that, yes, we allow you to pull out your phones and play with them a little bit during service. Uh, If you are a first-time guest, pull out your phone. Uh, We'd love for you to go to gfnchurch.org. On our website, there's a place where where you can fill out a digital connect card because we would love to get to know a little bit about who you are then we would also love to share with you a little bit about who we are, some of the different uh, events and activities, some of the different Bible studies and ministries uh, that are taking place uh, here at GFN Church. Also, if you want to support the the life and ministry here at GFN Church, uh, you can give uh, through our church, uh, give of your tithes and offerings through our church website or our church app. We even have two offering boxes, one at the back of the church and one to the side uh, over here uh, as well. But uh, like I said, we have got a lot going on. There's a lot of different events and activities going on here uh, at GFN Church. And I want to remind you, you have heard this phrase over and over again. We are a church that is for the upstate. Uh, We are a church that that loves uh, our community, that wants to provide for our community. We are a church that wants to share Christ with our community. And we've got some great opportunities uh, coming up uh, for that. One is our annual trunk or treat is coming up this coming Saturday here in just a few days. Uh, It is a great opportunity. We're going to have people from all over the upstate on our campus. Last year, we had a little little around 4,000 people. Just a great opportunity for us to provide a fun and family safe environment uh, for families to gather together. And uh, when we have an event that big, guess what? We need your help for that. Uh, we are still in need of, uh, of a few trunks, people to sign up to, to host trunks, to, to hand out candy. We are still in need of some people to join our, our welcome and greeting team. We are still in need of some people to uh, sign up and help direct parking. So please uh, let one of us on staff know, or you can go uh, to our, we- our website and fill out our fill out a, 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 excuse me, I'm getting tongue-tied, a volunteer registration form uh, for that uh, event. I also want to let you know that November 10th, uh, most of our ladies, a lot of our ladies will be gone for the ladies, uh, for the district ladies retreat, but we are going to have what we are calling tailgate talks for all the men in the church. Uh, We want to encourage you to come and make sure you are here that Sunday following the service. uh, We're going to be going over to the uh, student center We're going to have some chicken wings. We're going to be watching some football. Uh, We're just going to hang out. So uh, men will make sure to come and be a part of that. And our very own Lamoris Crawford is going to come and and share the word with us uh, that Sunday. And you do not want to miss it. Uh, That is going to be a great Sunday. And last of all, another opportunity for us to to reach out and share Christ with our community. Uh, You know, we had a successful soccer season with with Upward uh, this past past spring. Well, it was such a great time that we decided to, to, to do a basketball league, and uh, we're in need of, of help for that. So if you are interested in coaching, if you're interested in helping referee, if you're interested in setting up and tearing down, working concessions, working the table, uh, the, the timer, we would love to have you be a part of that. It is, was a great opportunity for us to truly get to know our community. So please come and see me if you're, if you're interested in that. Well, I've talked long enough, and uh, man, we, we're here to worship. So will you stand with me as Pastor Andrew leads us uh, in the Apostles' Creed as we affirm who we are and what we believe? Amen. Don't you love Pastor Andy? I know I do. Let's affirm what it is that we believe this morning, church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue to worship together, church.
God, this morning we do praise you. God, we do praise you for what you've done. God, we praise you for your love for each and every one of us. We praise you for your presence. God, this morning we praise you for new life. God, this morning some of us may be just feeling exhausted and worn out. Some of us may be feeling just beat up by life. God, some of us this morning may just be feeling just undeserving and unworthy of of what you've done for us. But God, no matter what, you are a God of grace and a God of mercy. Lord, no matter what, you look at us and you call us yours. So Lord, this morning, may our eyes be open to seeing you for who you are. God, this morning, may may we see us as as your children, as, as your beloved. God, my prayer this morning that is, your, is that your spirit continues to, to move within this place. That you fall on the hearts and on the lives of those that are just in desperate need of your life-transforming grace this morning. God, this morning, may we experience victory in you. Lord God, may we see that there is hope in knowing you and hope in living for you. And so, God, this morning, we choose not just to worship you, not just to praise you, not just to lift you up for who you are and for what you've done. But, God, this morning, we choose to completely give our lives over to you and call you our Lord, our Savior, our King. God, we thank you for what you've done. Lord, God, may we experience that life-transforming power. May we leave here today at the end of this service as new people because of what you're doing. God, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your healing power and your guidance, your provision. God, as we continue to worship this morning, I pray that you speak through Pastor David. May you, your spirit just fill him. May he be your, your mouthpiece as he comes to to share the message that you've laid on his heart. And Lord God, may we not just be hearers of the word, but may we receive your word. May we apply it to our lives. God, I pray that you just continue to move as we continue to worship. God, we praise you for what you've done, but God, we also praise you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. So, God, I pray that you just continue to do the work that you've already begun. We love you and we praise you. Amen. Good morning, church. It's great to see each and every one of you this morning. Uh, you get bonus points if you come to me afterwards and tell me who all was in those, uh, the, in those photos. 
Uh, I didn't make it too hard. Um, and uh, I thought about uh, I, I thought about adding presidents. Uh, if you go like number six through fifteen, those are like the presidents we forget, like you know, like the Zachary Taylors and the Millard Fillmores and the Franklin Pierces. You know, we forget about those. So I thought about I thought about putting those on there. Uh, but uh, yeah, bonus points if you can name everybody who was in those uh, in those in that in that bumper video as we as we move forward. Uh, but we're beginning this new series: Kings and Presidents, Politics. And the kingdom of God. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, wow, there's, there's two things I don't want to come to church and hear about. One is money and the other is politics. So uh, we're in this series. Uh, the next series is about tithing and money. So it's going to be a great. Uh, no, it's not. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, but you, um, I may be the only person here who finds this interesting. But we, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but Greenville, the the media market of Greenville serves three states. And so because of that, we get a taste. We get a taste of all the political environments in three states. And, and you see that through the ads uh, that we get on our news channels, right? So you're getting, getting ads for people who are running for Georgia politics and running for those things. You obviously get South Carolina and a little bit of North Carolina. And, and again, I know that I may be in the minority. I find that super interesting. I've never been in a media market in which three states uh, are, are buying time uh, in, in order, for, order for those folks to get elected. I, I, think it's, I think it's great. And we're in a, based on all the ads that you've been, you've been receiving, you know that we are just, uh, just under two weeks away uh, from an election season. So for the next few weeks as we move into election season, and really this series is, is designed to go past election day, and based on what happens, maybe we'll still need this. Maybe we'll still need some reminders about, uh, about what the kingdom of God is all about. I don't know. Well, I guess we'll find out. But over the next few weeks, we're in this series called Kings and Presidents. As we, as we look to understand the, the po- politics through, through the lens of the kingdom of God. Now, before we jump in, I want a few disclaimers that that I want to put out there. This isn't a topical uh, series on politics and how you should vote. This is what this is not what this series is about. Uh, This is actually a series based. It's going to be based in the Old Testament book of Second Kings, and most messages will be centered around a, 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 a narrative or a text that we find there in the Old Testament book of Second Kings. I'm really excited because. This is an opportunity for us to team teach. So I'm, I'm kicking it off this morning, and Pastor Andrew will be preaching next week. And then the following week, Pastor Andy will be preaching. And so my, my message isn't going to tell you how to vote, and their message probably will. I gave them the hard stuff. And uh, so, you know, not, not really. Um, so that's kind of how it's going to flow. Uh, but then just to kind of take a little sidestep here, November 10. Uh, we'll take a break from politics and we'll, 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 we'll come together as a church for what we're calling tailgate talks. Uh, this is for all, everybody. Uh, I know that when you see football and wings, if you're a lady, you're thinking, well, I'm not going to get away. Can, is this for me? Yes, absolutely it is. So this is certainly a time for everyone, all families that want to come together. And uh, my friend Lamoris Crawford is going to be preaching uh, in, in that service. Lamoris travels uh, all over the country, uh, representing uh, GFN Church, representing the Church of Nazarene, uh, speaking at, at events and doing uh, different retreats and marriage retreats that he and his wife do together. So I know that you're really going to enjoy the preaching ministry of Lamoris. And then afterwards, uh, Shane Evans is smoking some wings, and uh, it's going to be a really, really good day. So you certainly want to be a part for that. So bring, bring everyone uh, with you. Another thing to remember, though, about politics is it's okay to have an opinion. It's okay to have interest in politics. Sometimes I think as churches, uh, pastors get up here and it's like, you know, we, we just say generic things like, you know, vote the lamb, vote the cross, vote the Bible, and don't, you know, you're not, you're not allowed to get into the nitty-gritty. I think it's okay. I think it's okay to have an, an opinion about things, right? This is, uh, we are citizens of God's kingdom, and that, that is, of course, is our primary allegiance, but we are Christians who happen to live in this place called the United States of America, and we are super grateful uh, for those who have served, who have sacrificed, who have given the ultimate sacrifice uh, for us to be able to have these types of discussions. But we, yes, we are Christians who happen to live 
here in this nation. And so, yes, we are called to have some sort of, of interest in it. In fact, there are, there are multiple biblical examples of our faith ancestors being involved in the political system in which they were living. I can think about Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers and uh, through, through, the, through the leading of the Lord, rose to the ranks of being basically second in command there in, in Egypt. Uh, we also think about Daniel, uh, who when the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity, when they were in exile, uh, Daniel found favor with that government and, and rose to those ranks. I, I'm reminded of uh, prophets like Jeremiah, who say in Jeremiah 29, 7, says, Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city in which you are living, because when it prospers, or w- when you prosper, it will prosper. And the context there of Jeremiah, he is reminding the Israelites who were in exile at the time, they thought they were going to just be in exile for like a month or so, and Jeremiah was like, I got bad news for you. You need to settle in. It's going to be a little bit. So go and marry and go and build families and seek the peace and the prosperity of of the sea. So as Christians, we are called to be good stewards of what we have been giving. And and if that is political freedom, then we are called to to steward that that well. In fact, uh, being involved and having an opinion is important. In fact, that particular verse, Jeremiah 29, 7, that's what motivated me a season ago or season in my life to get involved with, with, with politics and, and, and to run in a, in a campaign and, and, and be elected and, and to serve uh, my community, our community that way. So this is, it's okay to have an opinion. And to, but this series, I want us to walk through, what does it mean to, yes, have an opinion, but also to keep in mind that the lens in which we are to see the world is through the lens of the kingdom of God. So the series, it goes beyond, it be goes, goes beyond the, li- the, the labels of conservatism or, 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 or liberal. And, and it goes far more important to that for us to be faithful to the Scripture, particularly in this series, faithful to the Scripture we found in 2 Kings. You know, one of the greatest concerns during any kind of election season is the concern of change. It could be that you're on the side of, well, we need change. Man, this, the last four years have just been a mess. We need some sort of change. Or you may be on the other side in which you're thinking, oh, my, oh my word. Like, if we get that kind of change, like, I have no idea what is going to happen uh, in the world in which we live. And so sometimes our biggest fear is is change. And while our political system should matter to us, it's, it's crucial for followers of Christ to remember that we're a part of a, of a much larger story. I'm going to put two images up, and these images that you will recognize here on the screen. Uh, now, we, we are familiar with these, these, these two images uh, in a room this size. Uh, some of us, you know, identify with one and identify with the other. Um, if you're if you're a Green Party or a Libertarian, sorry, uh, you know yours didn't make the cut, just like in the in the uh, um, in the debates. But but here's the thing: I really shouldn't have said that. There might be somebody who's really a Green Party here. I'm I'm sorry, my bad. Um, so <laughs> so we tend to think that our story gets wrapped up in one of these symbols, right? We. We see the world, we see the, the world through the lens of an elephant or a donkey. And if you've done any kind of history, these, the political parties got these, these symbols through, uh, through a cartoonist, a political cartoonist and, and satire writer in the 1800s named Thomas Nast. And, uh, and so he kind of gave these political parties their, uh, these, uh, these uh, mascots if you will. And so they didn't really adopt these. They just kind of were thrust upon them and they just, you know, went for it. And it was kind of a joke, right? So for Thomas Nast, he was like, you know, if you're a Republican, then you're just big and you're slow and you're always going in the wrong direction. Uh, if you're a Democrat, then you're always looking for a fight, looking to mess something up, looking to kick something down. You know, I, that was not my words. That was just the history of, 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 of how those came to be. But we see I'm getting off track. I could this. I really like this. I really love this stuff. All right, so I'm just going to have to 
You're going to have to bear with me, okay? <laughs> and there's, I, I realize there's like 30 of you. You're like, man, I really had a hard week. I'm, this is not going to encourage me. I think it will. Just hold on. Just hold on. But we see the world through these lenses, and we forget. Let me show you the next image, right? This, I mean, this is, this is the image that tells our story. Th- this is the image that tells the story of the followers of Christ. And, and, and the other two images, like they're, they're images of, of power and, and, and challenge and, and, and wanting to always, always win. But man, this symbol is very interesting. It's a, it's a symbol of defeat. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a symbol of surrender. In, in, in first century Rome, it was, a, it was a symbol of the death penalty. This is, where they, this is what they did with criminals. They, they hung them. They, they put them on that cross to punish them for their crimes. But as followers of Christ, as followers of the one who gave his life for you and I, who in order to save his life, gave his life, this is how, this is how we are to see the world through the lens of, of the cross. You see, if we're not careful, we can place a lot of faith in a particular party and we can start to believe that our only hope, our only hope can, can lie with the one who can have the right kind of power. There's this podcast called Presidential and they, uh, they, every episode is, is history of each president. I love, love presidential history. But what's interesting and this is why you don't put your hope in political power. It took, it took 15 presidents to deal with the issue of slavery. This is why political systems will let you down. Because for the first 14 or 15 presidencies, every person who came to power just kicked that can of slavery on down the, on down the road. Because I don't want to mess with that. That's a... It's a hot topic. I, I don't, I don't want to have to deal with that. I've got, I have other things in my agenda that I want to do. So if I can just kind of push that on down the road, then I won't have to worry about it. And again, I'm not making a point here other than just to make us aware, you cannot put our, your hope in political systems. You cannot put your entire hope, you cannot depend on the world to bring about the kingdom of God. You cannot depend on governments and politicians to bring about the kingdom of God. Only God can do that. And even in our country today, we still wrestle, we still wrestle with, with issues of race. I, I think it's, it is a symptom of, of, the, of the brokenness that we have, but it is the church. It is the church that brings about the kingdom of God. It is the church that, that should be leading the way in these types of issues. As believers, our trust should reside in God. And so we go to the book of 2 Kings. And the book of 2 Kings may not seem like the first place that you would think about when preaching about, about politics, but it's thoroughly a political book. Its stories are strange, bizarre even, but the strangeness reminds us of how strange we are as God's people. 2 Kings were it, it was written to a people living in exile. Now, what the things that took place, they were not quite in exile yet. You see, what as things took place in First and Second Kings, that was or that was oratory history. That was that was that was passed down from generation to generation. But as those writers of Israel began to compile their history. What we, what we find in 2 Kings as it was written and as it would have been read to the people of God, they would have found themselves in exile. And it was a, it, it was a way for them to remember their history. It was, a, it was a, a way for them to remember, don't forget who you are. You are God's people because... When you're a people living in exile, when you are a people living in a world that is not yours, sometimes the world can influence your lifestyle, right? 
The world can influence how you see the world. I hope you're I hope you're making the connection to what I said a little bit ago, that as believers, we are Christians who happen to live in the United States of America, that, that our, this is not our home. And so in the same reason that 2 Kings was written to an exiled people so that they don't forget who they are, today we get our Bible so that we do not forget who we are. Because if we forget who we are, we can quickly find ourselves living life according to the elephant or according to the donkey or according to whatever political movement that you find yourself to be a part of. And so we come to 2 Kings and what's interesting about 2 Kings is this. If you know anything about history and how it's written, you know that the victors write history. That's, that's how it works. Uh, we're coming up on this, I, I, you guys are like, this guy's a nerd. He's getting off his notes. But we're coming up on the sister centennial of the American Revolution, the 250th revolution and of the American Revolution. And we all grew up, we all grew up with, with, uh, with cities like Lexington and Concord and Saratoga being how we learned about the American Revolution, but we forget that the majority of the battles fought in the Revolution happened here in the South. Now, my point is, to the victors write, write history. And so when you take yourself back to the Civil War, of the American Civil War, coming out of the Civil War, who wrote history? The North. And so that's, that's kind of why we've, we've grown up with those names and we've forgotten about the Camden and, and, and the Calpins and the Kings Mountain and all of those type of things. And this is really fun. I, I hope you guys are having fun with this. <laughs> but it's in, my point is this. It's interesting. We know that victors write the history books. But if you read 2 Kings, what you don't get are a lot of victory stories about the great kings of Israel. In fact, if you would read First and Second Kings cover to cover, you read it and you, and you say, goodness gracious, you know, what, what, a, what a bunch of, you know, incompetent imbeciles, you know, that were in charge of, of, of Israel. The stories you do get in Second Kings, the stories of victory, the story of faithfulness come as we read about the prophets of God in First and Second Kings, and so this what we see in First and Second Kings is a vivid, it's a vivid picture of, of what it is to 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 put your play, put your faith in political systems and watch those political systems fail you, and what it means to, to, to pursue the alternative of placing your faith in the God, in, the, in creator God, in placing your faith in the one true God. And so I'm convinced that, that 2 Kings is, is, is helping us see that there's always these conflicting stories between the kings or the empire and the kingdom. There is a way that the kings want to do things, and then there is a way that the kingdom says we are to do things. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be reminded of what story we are a part of. Instead of focusing on the story of a political party, we are going to remind ourselves that the only story that is to shape our lives is this story of God. We're going to be reminded that the kingdom has its own way of doing things and has its own way of seeing the world. And many times it's opposite of the way of kings and the way of presidents. And so let's turn to the text, first, or second Kings, excuse me, chapter 2. Israel was facing a change in second Kings. But it wasn't a change in their king. They were changing prophets. Any, everyone, anyone heard of the prophet Elijah with a J? Everybody's kind of somewhat familiar with Elijah. So when we come to 2 Kings, we are cued in on there's, a, there's going to be a change. Elijah is going to be taken away. He's going to be swept up. A chariot's going to come and, and pick him up. Now, here's the thing about Elijah. Elijah was a household name in Israel. Now, we, we don't always, you don't always see this in, in biblical scripture, 
but there were multiple prophets of the Lord. There, there were more prophets of the Lord than we actually have a book for. I mean, you had minor prophets that we, we read about those, the Obadiahs and the Habakkuks and all those, but, but there were a host of prophets. And some were more well-known than others. And Elijah, he was the prophet. I mean, he was the one that people sat around the tables like, man, if we had Elijah back, now those were the days. Elijah, now he knew how, he knew how to tell them, to give them the what for. You remember when he brought the fire down on the altar on the, on the prophets of Baal? That was the one that grandparents sat around the table saying, man, those days of Elijah. We should write a song about that, right? Um, now, we don't do that, right? We don't have leaders that we sit around and say, man, the days of, right? We don't do that. And so there was this anxiousness. There was this nervousness because people knew that Elijah's time was short and his protege was some wannabe that had a name similar to his, Elisha. Now, Elijah, he was, a, he was a man's man, you know, wore a leather belt around his waist, long hair. I mean, he just, Elisha, he was a little smaller in stature, didn't have as much hair as Elijah. There's a verse about that. Kids, respect your elders. That's your Easter egg. Look that up after church. Why should I respect my elders? Read that. So hear the word of the Lord, 2 Kings. Finally, he's getting to scripture. <clears throat> Verse 7, 50 men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The, wa the, the water divided it to the right and to the left, and, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two men. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck with the water with it. Where now was the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided the right to the, and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho, who were watching, said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. This is the word of the Lord. Are you thankful? Thanks be to God. And so we know that Elisha has been anointed to take Elijah's place. Elijah had called Elisha out of a farm field. He was a farmer. Like, like I said, came from very, very humble means. Did not, probably didn't have the gravitas, didn't have the, the demeanor of Elijah. But Elisha knows that Elijah will not die, that God's going to come and, and take him away. And, and in fact, he doesn't want to miss this. In fact, even the other prophets were so concerned about this. If you read, if you read prior to verse, uh, verse 7, Elijah and Elisha, they travel to Gilgal, they travel to Bethel, and every town they go into, every town they arrive in, that says the host of prophets, they go up to Elisha. They say, hey, did you know your boss about to be taken up? What are we going to do? And, and, and it's interesting because Elisha, Elisha, his reply literally is, yes, I know, now be quiet. It's like everywhere Elisha goes, he gets reminded, hey, you're not as good as the other guy. What are we going to do when he gets taken up? 
And, and so this is, this is the anxiety, if you will, that, that's, that's, that's running through the, the area there. They know that Elijah, Elijah is about to be taken up, and what are they going to do? So Elijah, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to miss this. And even after he's urged to, to just stay behind, he insists that he's going to follow Elijah to the very end. And finally, finally Elijah just says, well, what can I do for you? Look at verse 9. It says, tell me, it says, let me inherit, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. Now, you can read this, and it's like, man, what, what's, what does, he, does he want his personality? Like, does he want, like, what does he want? And the reference here goes back to how families would pass down the inheritance. And so if a father had two sons, the inheritance would be split by threes, and the youngest would receive only one portion, and the oldest would receive the double portion. That, that's what, that's what Elisha is referring to. When he says, I want a double portion, essentially, I want to be your son. I want to be seen as your eldest son so that whatever, whatever you have, I want it. The ministry that you have, I want that. Elisha's full embrace of his future prophetic role is underscored by his request for the firstborn's portion of the Spirit of God from his, quote, father, Elijah. And Elijah, he says, can you watch me? Can you cling to me to the very last moment? And so then we get this image of these, these chariots of fire. They, they come down from heaven. They, they separate Elijah and Elisha. And just like that, Elijah is gone. Only his cloak or his mantle remain. Now the cloak is the cloak is very important here because in this in this time, so you would have had undergarments that you would have wore, uh, long just kind of very basic basic things. But then your someone's cloak, that that kind of gave identification as to where they're from, what they're about, the things that they're that they're into. It would even give them your economic status. So so if you had a cloak that was very ornate. That that meant, oh, you you must come from some sort of some sort of means, and so what Scripture says here is what is left. What is left is just his his cloak. In fact, even before people would could recognize you by your face, you'd be recognized by the cloak that you would wear, the the mantle, if you will. And so you get this scene. And if you're a Star Wars fan, I'm getting Star Wars vibes here. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just saying. You know, you get this scene and the fire and chariots come down and like, boom, he's gone. And it's like, it's like uh, this, this, this cloak just kind of like falls and it just lands there on the ground. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but it'd be really cool if that's how it happened. You know, kind of a... You know, that, that, that feeling that Doc Martin get, got when the DeLorean just off and just, he's just left with fire. And, and so Elisha picks it up and he puts it on. And we get reminded that it's not about, it's not so much about the leader as much as it is who is the leader following, who who, who is with the leader? And in putting this, this cloak, this, this mantle on, it was, this, it was a symbol of, it wasn't about who, who Elijah was. It was about what God had done through him and what God was doing through him. And so God is going to continue to be faithful. For those who were worried about change, for those who are worried about what's the future going to hold, when people saw this, it was like they said, oh, okay, okay. It's a, it's a different person, but it's the same cloak. It's the same mantle. It's the same God who has been faithful from generation to generation. In fact, my friend, my friend Tim Gaines puts it this way. He says, the goodness in Elijah's leadership 
wasn't actually found in Elijah at all. It was in the way Elijah cloaked himself in God's faithfulness. And now Elisha wears the same cloak. There was fear around the chains, but now the others see that Elisha now wears the cloak. Elisha may be new, but the mantle is not. Still, there were some who didn't believe what they saw, so they insisted in going and looking for Elijah. If you read further down in the verse, somebody, they come up to say, well, Elijah's somewhere. And Elijah just looks at him and says, well, you can go, go look for him if you want to. I've got work to do. They never found Elijah. So here's our takeaway. We live in a world where political campaigns are going to tell us to be afraid if there is or if there isn't a change in a particular office. The kingdom says do not fear and look for God's faithfulness from generation to generations. People of God, we are not to be people of fear. But I can tell you this, we live in a world in which the strategy behind every political campaign is fear. I remember when I, when I decided to run for office, I sat down and, and met with a guy who had, who had done it before. And I said, hey, give me, give me some advice on campaign. He goes, that's all you need to know. The well, only thing people are worried about is what they're afraid of and their pocketbook. And I was like, dude, I'm just running for county council. Like, this, is, this sounds like, like I'm just trying to pave some roads and do some sewer stuff here. Like, man, you really took it like, he's like, fear, money. That's all you got to do. I'm like, okay, check, please. Um, but that is true. That, pay attention to every ad that's going to come at you for the next two weeks. The ad is, you should be afraid. Right? So if... If you're watching a, a, an ad from the Democratic Party, you should be afraid if he gets back in. And then you see all these images of why you should be afraid. If you're on the other side, you should be afraid if she gets elected. And then you get all these images of, these, of the last four years and things they've said. And I, I'm just saying, that's just, that's the tactic behind it. I'm saying, you vote for who you want to vote for, but just be aware Let's not vote out of fear because that's what they want you to be. They want you to be afraid. And I would argue that as the people of God, we walk into the ballot box not out of fear, but we walk into the ballot, ballot, ballot box with our, just our principles and how we, see the, how, how we see the world and what we think should happen, not based on fear, but on based on how we feel led. People of God, we are not to be afraid. Now, this translates into everything, right? This isn't just a political thing. We could see this in our churches. Oh, there's a, there's a change. There's a, there's a new pastor. There's, there's a new ministry. There's something new going on. It, it, there, there's always these questions about what the future is going to look like because it's a different. What is the same? Faces may change. But what is the same is the mantle of God's faithfulness. The fact that we have been about the work of the gospel for over 76 years, and that will never change. So let's not be a people of fear. No matter who the leader is, as long as the Spirit of the Lord is leading, we don't have any reason to fear. And I think as we move through 2 Kings, we're going to be reminded that great leaders are the ones whom the Spirit of the Lord rests. Great leaders are the ones who recognize, man, first of all, they don't have all the bright ideas that there is a higher power. There, there, is, there is a place where wisdom comes from. And so let's wrap it up this morning. Over the next few weeks, ask ourselves, let's ask ourselves this question. Are our lives being shaped by the story of the kings? The, the politics that strike fear in us because of who may or may not be elected? Or are we shaped by the story of God, which is a story of God's faithfulness, no matter the results 
of the elections. It's a story, are we shaped by the story that says, man, kings and kingdoms fall. But what moves on, what lives on is the powerful in the name of Jesus. And I know we all have opinions and it's important to be involved in the process, but may we not allow the, the new cycle to, to lead us with fear. Let's not allow the, the political party to overshadow what God has called us to and how God has called us to see the world. May we never forget that we serve a God who is faithful. Yes, we have opinions. Yes, we would rather one versus the other. Yes, we have a way in which we see how economics should be and how we feel like foreign policy will be. And, and th those, are all, those are all fine discussions. But we keep in mind the primary story that moves our lives is the story of God. The story of God who is faithful to us. Because in two or three weeks, when we know the results of this election, guess who, guess what? God is still going to be on the throne. God is still going to be sovereign. God is going to continue to be faithful to us as he always has been before. I invite you to stand. And this morning, we're simply going to end this way of being reminded of a God who is faithful of God who has always been faithful to us. And our, our, our primary call is to put on that mantle, to put on that mantle that represents God and his goodness and his faithfulness to the world around us. Let's sing together.
in this way. I was, I was texting uh, my brother this week who is a pastor in Kansas City and we're just talking about the next few weeks coming up and he shared this prayer with me and I want to if you'll afford me the opportunity and the privilege I want to I pray this prayer as a, as a way to, to end our time together. God we stand here and ask that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing unto you. Father, we humbly come into your presence, eternally grateful that we can bring our petitions, concerns, and supplications to you. We acknowledge Jesus as our great high priest who intercedes on our behalf, and we offer this prayer in a deep and imperfect groan that we trust your Holy Spirit will make make it known to you. We recognize the importance of the upcoming election here in the United States, but we do so in full full view of the Bible's revelation that nation states are temporary, transitory. And while we recognize that every human empire will one day be replaced with your eternal kingdom, we live in these United States with honor, admiration, gratitude for life we are blessed with in this nation. We recognize the arrangement of liberty and justice as a gift from your common grace, sustained by your sovereign care and given to us to steward and enjoy. So Lord, as your people, we, may we partner with you to make our communities a better place where human life flourishes. And in this season, we ask for your wisdom as we vote for leaders who will craft policies and enforce laws that, that result in human flourishing. You said in your word, if any of you lacks wisdom, You should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault and will be given to you. We ask now for the good and perfect gift of wisdom in this season. We ask for your wisdom as we consider leaders who promote and work for peace throughout the world. We ask for your wisdom as we consider leaders that provide the people of God the freedom to carry out the work of your kingdom. We ask for your wisdom as we consider leaders who protect and honor the sanctity of human life, including the life of the unborn. Give us leaders, O Lord, the value of holistic ethic of life that cares for the widow and the orphan, the sick and the lonely, the downtrodden and the unemployed, the prisoner, the homeless, the stranger and the enemy, the thirsty and the powerless. We ask for your wisdom as we consider leaders who carry out justice to create a peaceful society of neighborly concern. May we be a society of a fair and unbiased laws applied equally and equitably to all. We ask for your wisdom as we consider leaders who cast a compelling and hope-filled vision for what it looks like for all of us to be more responsible citizens in our community and not just selfish consumers of our economy. We ask for your wisdom and, 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 and as we consider leaders who promote policies that, valuable, that value honorable work with livable wages made available for all to participate in. We ask for your wisdom as we consider leaders who ensure vulnerable persons are given the aid they need to become whole again and empowered to live again as responsible citizens. And while time does not permit us to, to name every person on the ballot, we do so lift, uplifting those seeking the pres- this office of President of the United States. I pray for President Donald Trump and Madam Vice President Kamala Harris. May they know your presence, O oh God, as they pursue the opportunity to, to once serve our nation as president. Give them divine wisdom and discernment, remind, reminding them of the greatest use of this powerful platform is to follow the call of the prophet Micah, who says, who calls us to seek justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly before you. 
May we make our children proud of how we conduct ourselves this season. We know our human tendencies toward finger pointing and frivolousness, but we ask that you would replace this with the fruit of the Spirit. Give us, O Lord, humility to listen to our sisters and brothers across the political spectrum because your kingdom is not divided into red states and blue states. Equip us with moral imagination to have real discourse. Knit us, O God, as one country, even as we wrestle over the complexity of how we ought to live and govern. Give us gratitude for the right and to dissent and to disagree. For we know that we are bound up in one another and have been given the tremendous opportunity to extend humanity and grace when others voice their deep held convictions when they differ from our own. And give us wisdom, God, to discover honest solutions, for we know it will take all of us. And I pray that Democrats, Republicans, pray justice, pray for mercy, progress, and solutions above partisanship. Now, Lord, we close our prayer with the same prayer that your son Jesus was praying to the church when he said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so, Lord, we offer this prayer, Lord, knowing that your kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, and we give you all the glory and all the praise for what you have done, for what you're going to do. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said together, amen, amen, GFN Church. You are, are dismissed. Go in grace, go in peace.